Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Feed Your Please, a hateful voyage through the Delta Quadrant. I'm your host, Peter. And I'm your co-host, Joseph. Peter, it's lovely to be back with you yet again, and this time not like right after I had surgery done. Feel a little bit more spry, a little bit more of a spring in my step right now. Yeah, you're over the place. From uh, getting your neck cut off to Florida vacations. A lot of... Yeah. A lot of spectrum in your life right now. Yeah, you know, uh, di- didn't have cancer, so that was nice. And uh, pretty great always to hear that. And uh, then my sister graduated from law school, and we had a, a big family vacation slash uh, party central uh, for a few days. It was it was cool. So congrats to my sister, uh, Cassie. Uh, I know you won't listen to this because you think Star Trek is kind of stupid and weird, uh, but but by some chance, if you ever do, congratulations. Wait, she thinks Star Trek's what? Yeah, well, you know, some Wait, things Star, don't necessarily Star Trek's translate. stupid and weird? Is that what you said? Yeah. I think she'd love this podcast. We, <laughs> we, we think Voyager's very stupid and weird most of the time. Uh, you have a point there. This could be a good entry point on just being a general hater of Star Trek and really just reveling in it. You don't have to be a fan that also hates it. You can just be a hater. Speaking of entry points and haters, let's jump on to our next subject. Tell your friends about us. Tell your friends who hate Star Trek. Tell your friends who only love Star Wars or Doctor Who and just hate the hell out of Star Trek. Say, hey, listen, guys, you got to give this a listen. Not that these guys hate Star Trek, but they hate stupid. And there's just so much stupid in Voyager that there's a good chance you're going to be on the same page with them. Uh, it'll really brighten up their day and uh, help everybody out a lot. Hey, you know, are you on Tumblr and are part of the Super Who Lock community, a inexplicable combination of Supernatural, Doctor Who, and Sherlock, which is a thing that exists? We don't care. That might be stupid, but so is Voyager. Share this podcast so everyone else can know how stupid it is. I got to tell you today about a new app that I got turned on to. It's called Whisper. Have you heard about this? No. What is that? You install it on your phone and it's like a lazier version of 4chan. And it's basically. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So it's a geolocation based, right? So you can you can set your settings to see stuff that's like super local or like far away and by popularity. And people write a post like. um What's very popular in my area is people who want uh, to get high and girls to come over and get high and then probably screw them. So it's it's guys advertising like, hey, who wants to come over and smoke weed? Uh, and then it suggests what the background picture for this post should be. And you can like swipe between them and then they hit post and it goes up and it seems to be anonymous, but it has direct messaging. And then people reply and their replies have uh, backgrounds. And I found it to be very good for trolling and hurtful comments on the internet, which is what the internet's there for. But then there's communities and there's actually a very specific community just for Voyager. And I'm thinking of unleashing this on them. Yeah. (laughs) And it's the most asinine stuff on there too, man. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw something up on there. We'll see what ends up happening. God, the internet is the best and also the worst. I can't believe that's a thing. It is. I mean, Wow. It's crazy. Wow, that is that's rife with danger. There's so much danger it, in that. Why would you make that? Someone check it out. And if I don't post uh to Voyager thing, then someone else should and it'll be it'll be interesting. This this is like some Dr. Malcolm shit from Jurassic Park. We were so obsessed with if we could, we didn't stop to think yeah. if we should. <laughs> like, wow, that's fucking that's Life insane. But yeah, let's go ahead and abuse okay. it for our personal purposes. And and we want people to listen to the show, not because we have an economic need. We just want more people to revel in this pig shit with us. And, this, and, and that's important to us as people. As haters. You know, for, for other people to suffer. Yeah, as haters. For other people to hate. Um, and more the merrier. So uh, on a different note, though, you ready to talk about uh, this week's episode? I don't know if I am because we're over here talking about hate and uh, as we move into season two, episode three projections, um, we got a couple different things going on here. Most notably, this episode is going to be one of the leftovers from season one. That was very obvious, but yes. 
It, was it very obvious? I think it was when it really started to get its shit together and started getting going. You saw the 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 likelihood that they they shot this in season one much more clearly. The only thing that I really had a strong indicator that this was season one was the tricorders were the old style, not the uh, the new ones that we just got introduced to in the last one. But um, you know, this is the third episode for this season. Again, a holdover from uh, season one, but unlike the 37s, uh, this was, in my opinion, really good. And coming on the heels of another episode that I didn't, you know, I didn't think it was the best, but I, I thought uh, Initiations was still a pretty strong episode. Seasons two so far is shaping up to be uncharacteristically good for Voyager. I didn't care much for our last week's uh, uh, installment. Uh, I think we were, um, I think we were so just destroyed after the thirty sevens that the semblance of quality and some of the the guest acting and Kazon backstory overwhelmed what was otherwise bad. Um, so you had lowered but, expectations. Yeah, the, but this is that was a rebound was just, episode for you. But not, not, I think it was a rebound episode for you, my friend. I think I saw it for what it was. I just edited that bad boy. I assure you, I uh, I was more skeptical than you. You were, you were, uh, you're all about it. You know, I I maintained the haters' distance. I maintained it. On this one though, it starts off slow, and it that helps the payoff so much. And out of all the episodes that we have watched on this show so far, it is the one that seems to be unequivocally helped the most by who directed it. Yeah, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, I got to say, I came out of this episode with very minimal notes, so I'll be interested to see where we go because there seemed to be so little for me to nitpick on. Uh, but the biggest criticism I had, and, and kind of the first red flag something was up, was the episode starts off with uh, the EMH materializing in sick bay, uh, him looking around asking for you know, what's the nature of the medical emergency, not seeing anyone, then asking how he was activated and the computer replying that uh, he was activated as a precaution because the ship entered a red alert and he was automatically summoned as part of that, which right off the bat, it, it seems to be the first time it's ever happened to him. So we're led to one of two conclusions. One, Voyager's never declared a red alert before. Two, there's something fishy going on. Battery's just confused. Um but everyone appears to be gone. He gets a lot of dialogue with Mangel Barrett, which let's take a moment to appreciate how much dialogue she probably recorded over the course of her career doing Berman era Trek doing computer voice. I mean, when you think about how much dialogue she had in this episode, just as the computer voice mm -hmm. back and forth. And to think that like every episode where they ask the computer for any kind of information she has to record that dialogue you know man she put in some work i would have to one. think that the amount of <clears throat> so i got a google home and i just saw they pushed out an update that you can change the voice packs i think there's like eight of them now and they all sound great uh you know i don't think any of them are necessarily pre-recorded voices i think they're all synthetic and phonetically sounding out the text that they're you know working off of but i have to think that at the very least there has to be enough uh, Magell in the Star Trek library that at the very least they should be able to put together some like GPS navigation packs out of everything she's recorded. I think it'd be pretty cool if you could have, uh, you know, the option for some sort of home assistant to one day have the Star Trek computer voice, you know, telling you your daily briefing or who won the sports game. That's basically my dream since childhood. And I want it to be real. So let's hope. Let's hope. Internet that hears this, all hundred of you or so, if there's a Google engineer among you and we just don't know, make this dream a fucking reality. I think you mean to Do say this. make it so. Oh, oh, oh you cad. <laughs> so uh, after he gets the download from the computer, though, he's he's um, come to the conclusion there's been a shipwide disaster. Everyone is gone. Uh, he accesses a log from Janeway that suggests that's true. 
he asks the computer where the crew is and the computer's like oh i don't know i'm not i i don't know and then later on like deductive reasoning or it was after the log she says i told the crew members to abandon ship and then he asks uh you know what's the status of the uh lifeboats you know the emergency escape pods and she's like oh all the emergency escape pods are gone it's like you bitch you know goddamn well what happened to this crew you're holding out on me <laughs> i mean i think i think ultimately the these nitpicks that i had initially i've kind of was just scratched out or or i'm ignoring because it's part of the story sure like the and- inconsistencies is, is is explained by what they ultimately reveal about what's going on explained or hand i would say it's maybe they're not intentional and it just we can head cannon them into you know this episode you know we've had a couple ai centric episodes where we've gone pretty deep into discussion on this stuff i, I would say this episode really kind of drives in the point like the emh is so useful okay it turns on when there's a red alert essentially you know he's invincible or should be invincible to you know any sort of dangers or harm why stop with the emh why not have emergency engineer triage teams that could stay behind when you know the the garage door is coming down and engineering and that's filling up with poison gases you could have holograms zap in there and keep working on stuff like it's such an easy rabbit hole to fall down of why not make the entire ship ready at a moment's notice to be completely replaced by holograms and, and keep this motherfucker going in a firefight? I'm going to presume that the, the limitation on that would be that uh, installing the level of hollow emitters necessary and devoting the amount of power necessary to operate that kind of backup life-saving be... technologies, ship-saving technologies, day-saving well, technologies. Well, I mean, when you think about it, you know, the ship saving element would come into play when systems are at their most low, highest level of stress and may not be able to manifest, you know, a dozen independently operating holograms to save the ship. Fair enough. And that's, I think that that cottons the available facts. So he's getting the scoop from the computer that shit has gone real sideways, that there are no life signs on the ship and he is alone. So he starts recording a, you know, personal log saying that. He's no longer needed and that uh, basically he's going to give up any sort of uh, any notion that he could have any agency in this situation. <laughs> um, and rather than trying to save the day and get the ship on track and and find the lost crew and pick everybody back up, he's just going to turn himself off, call it a day, and, and that's going to be that. At this point in the show... Again, the the medical. No, they hadn't scanned anyone yet. There was enough yeah, yeah. fishy stuff going on at this point that I was like, "Is this some sort of a simulation that Voyager Senior Command is putting the doctor through to see how reliable is this guy in a pinch? Is he worthy of promotion essentially, and could he be a day saver?" And if that's the case, I'm like, him throwing in the towel this quickly and just calling it quits like that's a real f for effort for this guy. Fortunately, before he gets the chance, someone tries to break into sick bay, and it turns out that someone is everyone's favorite uh, cup throwing ankle assassin, uh, uh, Bolana Torres, uh, who relates that the Kazon showed up, ambushed the ship, fucked it all up, and then kidnapped all the dudes off the ship when everyone headed for the escape pods. But the captain and she heroically stayed behind to prevent the ship from exploding, and therefore that is why they're all still there. While she's giving this story, the doctor attempts to scan her with medical equipment, including the vintage Season 1 TNG era uh, tricorder. And this is where the real first indications that some shit is up, is that none of it seems to be working to scan her. And uh, she shrugs it off, explains... You know, everything's all effed up because of the Kazons, but that her complicated new holographic projection shit system is still working. And as a consequence, she can easily send him to the bridge so he could uh, uh, treat the captain who's still up there, uh, presumably in some level of distress. And off he goes. She uh, warns him that he's ha- going to have uh, some increased culpability while out in the field 
you know, to exposure to environmental hazards like force fields, phaser fire and other dangers. So basically he needs to keep his head down because he's not invincible. Uh, they zap him up there. The bridge looks like shit. There's a very large structural support beam that's laying down across the middle. It's crushed some crewmen. Uh, the <laughs> the bridge looks significantly more damaged than, you know, even when the ship got nap halfway across the galaxy and, you know, 50 some crew members died. So it's a very, very true, very credible uh, war torn ship. Big pat on the back to the Kmart Klingons for pulling this one off. He finds uh, Janeway laying underneath a piece of debris. Hypo sprays her in the neck, and uh, before you know it, she's back up on her feet. I I will say that uh, Kate Mulgrew does some really soap opera level pain acting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it's, who's noticeably bad? Um, and it's also uh, the consistency continues in that uh, the medical equipment doesn't work. Doctor tries to scan her, doesn't work. Uh, before they can. Also, uh, in continuity is the fact that Captain Janeway's hair continues to be a mood ring for Voyager's health, and it is very disheveled. She's having a very <laughs> bad time. I mean, we're not at lesbian chic hair right now, so um, not the best of hair days, but probably not the worst. Um, before they can do much about fixing the ship, uh, they get a call in from Snarf Snarf. That uh, he's uh, dealing with a Kazon intruder in the uh, the the mess hall, and this next shot. So the, the next scene is uh, Janeway's like, "All right, I'm gonna buzz you down there, Doctor, because you can actually get down there quickly because nothing's working, and and you can help, you know, snarf snarf deal with this guy." The silly scene that that they they have where this dumb space cat is taunting a Kazon with a rifle whilst throwing like. Fruit, pots he's, and pans at him. And he's fruit. throwing yeah. apples and oranges. This is the stupidest scene in the whole episode, hands down. Real for what is a very good episode for me. Uh, this is just garbage. So yeah, he gets beamed into the uh, whatever their ten Ford mess hall is. Let me let me defend this for a second, Peter. It is stupid and silly. Hold on, but it's uh, wait. Let me strap on my galoshes. I think I'm gonna have to walk through some real <laughs> bullshit here. Okay, go ahead. I'm ready. <laughs> It is soup, stupid and silly. I think it's stupid and silly on purpose. The way that it's shot with the whole like peekaboo camera and like how he's like popping out and taunting the way that like he's kind of off kilter framed. It, it's, I think, supposed to convey that this is really weird and out of character for the cowardly Neelix to be so brave in the face of an, an armed assassin there to take the ship over and probably kill him. And that's where it really sinks in. Like there's some shit that is not right about this. Like now tech stuff, not working was one thing. This is something else. This is really weird. The problem though, and- Joe is that this does not exist in a vacuum of intelligence. Uh, we have been exposed to nonsense like this on Voyager before. So, It's par for the course. I have to take it at face value. It's a dirty space cat holding a dude with a rifle at bay with oranges and uh, apples. It is what happens. If you want me to buy into it, have him get some of this plague cheese, blast a dude in the face with that, and like a close up as he's like slowly dying of asphyxiation because the cheese has poisoned him to death. (laughs) I mean, it's true. That's the other hint something's wrong. Neelix has more... uh... Uh, deadly weapons at his disposal uh, from a culinary perspective than what he was using. In the end, the doctor throws like a failed clothesline at this guy, but no, it's enough. No, he comes for... up from behind and chokes him with a with a whisk. Oh, was it a whisk? <laughs> I thought he found like a crowbar laying there. I was like, no, that's that's a whisk. He's about to go whisk his ass. So the doctor apparently has no do no harm protocols. And yeah, just basically moves in to choke this Kazon out. Uh, Neelix comes up and crushes his skull with a saute pan. And uh, shortly after the the takedown, uh, Neelix points out to the doctor that he's somehow bleeding, which rightfully confuses the doctor, who is a hologram and should not have any sort of uh, blood or guts or anything else. And they zip him back up to sick bay. He says that he's feeling pain and he's not programmed to feel pain, which I always thought was weird that... 
if he's not programmed to feel pain, what would he know pain feels like? But um, they move past that pretty quickly because he's starting to get information that suggests that he is real, like he's a real person, and that is why he is bleeding. Uh, the computer tells him who he is and it tells him that he is, in fact, Louis Zimmerman, um, a person who looks exactly like, you know, Robert Picardo, except in an orange uniform. Um, but he, he seems unable to accept this explanation because, of course, it runs counter to everything that he knows. And not too long after that, Janeway uh, shows up with uh, the Kazon and Snarf Snarf and Torres. Uh, Torres and the Doctor's pretty polaxed by this revelation that he's not who he thinks he is and explains it to Janeway who also thinks all of this is weird. So what's going on here? Cause I, I want to touch on it. This was a really cool episode and there's a lot of neat stuff in the details up to this point, the tricorders and other medical devices have failed to register any of the crew. They've chalked it up to systems damage. He hits himself with the tricorder and sees that he registers organic. And that's when he turns a tricorder on the rest of the other people confirms that nobody has life signs. He's trying to access his uh, memory location in the computer and basically run diagnostics. The computer's telling him none of those uh, computer locations exist. And then, yeah, so Janeway's in there. He's pitching this to Janeway. Janeway is genuinely participating in his discussion and deliberation process, uh, acknowledging that something seems very wrong. And in the process, says, hey, computer, turn off all the holograms on Voyager and in the result, everybody except for the doctor phase out. And this is where the best part of the, I mean, this is where the episode really takes off. It takes about 15 minutes to get here. It's kind of slow and weird at first. And they hit this point and this is where shit really starts to take off. And it takes off with the arrival of your friend and mine, one Lieutenant Reginald Barkley. Let's, let's hear it for Reg. Absolutely good to see this. Everybody's space. favorite yes. holiday. Holo, ugh, everybody's favorite holodeck creeper in the flesh. No, in the, oh my god, not in the flesh, I, in the uh, in the hologram. I, I, we were saying, we were saying last episode about how even TNG managed to have some like solid side recurring characters that were were maybe sparingly used, but still used lovingly. Reg Barkley was always the first on my mind when I thought of that. King of the Hill, man. And, and, and Ensign Rowe. Yeah. Number two. But uh, great choice on the part. I don't know if this was Frakes. I don't know if this was the writer or what, but uh, pulling pulling the Barkley out is perfect for this whole situation. And it gets more perfect as they explain what's happening. So this, super character, -like. this character in the episode that Barkley's portraying uh, originally was written to be Jordy LaForge. Ooh. I think Wolf. it was a better choice to go with uh, with Reg, though. Yeah, so Reg, I, I, think, I think Reg is perfect. Although Jordy would have been fun, but yeah, yeah, Reg is perfect. He's wearing one of the new jumpsuit style uniforms. His costuming doesn't stop there, though. And something that kind of haunts me through the whole episode is this. I, I gotta assume that's what a toupee they got him rocking in this thing. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Dwight Schultz is bald. bald so sticks out real bad. Uh, it poor does, choice. but. Very poor. But uh, he's very Reg-like. He's very much like the Reg we, we got to know and love there on, on TNG. And he's trying to explain to the Doctor that he actually is this Lewis Zimmerman guy. And that this whole Voyager that uh, thing that he's on is actually a simulation he programmed uh, for some study about long-term isolation between Federation Maquis. Something very strangely specific to his circumstances. And this is where a, a little interesting series canon gets laid down. Evidently, it's been six months since Voyager I got lost in the Delta too. Quadrant. Yeah. And uh, Reg is trying to tell the doctor, no, really, you've only been here for six hours. Uh, there's this whole radiation leak thing that happened due to a, a, an anomaly. Typical and holodeck nonsense. You're trapped. We can't get in. The system's got to play itself out. And also... Uh, you're slowly die you're quickly dying and if we can't get in there to save you um your brain's gonna melt 
And uh, by the way, also the transporters don't work and we can't beam you out because we can never just beam someone out of the fucking holodeck. Why, why would we be able to do that? There's a little bit of like in and out that the reg hologram does to simulate conversation with people who are supposed to be off camera where he relates this information and then comes back to say, this is how we can fix it. And the way that reg suggests the doctor can be fixed is he destroys Voyager, which would end the program, which is when kind of the bells and whistles start going off in your head of like, oh shit, is this like an alien like plot to destroy Voyager using the doctor? And then like immediately that's what the like the doctor assumes like you must be an alien that's fucking with me. Yeah. Like uh, and perfect, perfect jump to conclusion uh procedure here. I think they do a great job playing the audience. It's certainly the first place I went. And I have to say, right until Reginald, uh, or right until Barkley proposes that the doctor blow the ship up, um, I was getting like a real quantum leap vibe. Uh, you know, the doctor with a Swiss cheese memory, not really sure what's going on, a helpful hologram coming in and trying to like argue things and then step out for sidebars and come back in with new outsider information it was a lot of fun no i mean the 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 slowness at the beginning part it all starts to kind of come together of like all the kind of weird shit you saw like why are they doing this this is weird and it's like oh wait there's something else going on and this explanation makes sense it it relies on our biases as star trek fans about holodeck malfunctions in a in a cool way that makes you like Okay, this is feasible that what Reg is saying in this case is true. Not just holodeck um, malfunctions. This is touch on a couple well covered Star Trek tropes. And again, the, the kind of the genius of this episode for me is they throw so many plausible, well worn paths at you. The holodeck trope, the kind of Manchurian candidate uh, outside holographic influencer what what was the next gen episode with uh i think it was Riker and the little kid had him caught in a holodeck and they made it seem like oh, yeah, it was yeah, Tom yeah. the one where at the end he's like an insect person or something like a gray alien it was a terrible costume but but again you know barkley coming in with uh hey i'm here to help destroy the ship destroy the ship it's the only way like whoa that escalated quickly so you don't really know you know how this thing's going to pan out because everything is equally credible at this point. Even the presence of, of Reg himself lends to the credibility that like, this is my job. I help like help you program. That's what I do now. Cause the D has been destroyed. Right. Yeah. So Reg has got to have something else to do before he makes his little cameo in uh, first contact. Right. Mm. You know, they're still bu- building the big E. So, uh, you know, like he's always been obsessed with holograms. We know that it's like the one major part of his character. So, yeah, all this is making sense. And the the next piece of the episode is Reg trying to convince the doctor that he's telling him the truth. And he does this through having the doctor go through the pilot again. Genius. So, this a it was genius. B this is where you could really tell it was a season one episode because it really looks like they shot these scenes during the pilot because everyone's hair is right. Like the the uniforms are all correct on everybody. They do this scene in in sick bay where he initially gets turned on and everyone's doing their dialogue beats exactly the same. Um, and it's convincing the doctor that he is in a simulation because this is of course. <laughs> If he remembers this is the first time he ever got activated. Let me lay the scene. Uh, Sick Bay's a wreck. Harry Kim has just initiated the EMH. He goes to get him and pull him over to a crew member. EMH is like, I've been here before. I know the diagnostic on or the diagnosis on the guy laying up on the bed. And what's cool is Paris is there and Harry Kim are there, is there. And they're still in continuity of what the what the how the scene should play out but when he starts deviating from the script they're reacting to it real time so they're like what's going on why aren't you responding to what we need you to happen um and i think probably my favorite part of this episode is how the doctor turns to the one guy and says he's got lacerations and you and he looks at kim have uh 
cancerous tumors growing on your chest. And Kim's like, what? And he's like, oh, wait, that hasn't happened yet. Like, he's like metagaming the episode. But I'm like, holy shit. They're talking specifically about caretaker syphilis on this guy. Now, yes! one thing that we've been just yes! harping the fuck on, that it's just this loose end that never gets addressed again. He's addressing it. What a perfect time for the writers to be like, oh, you've got these tumors on your chest, but you don't know that yet. Don't worry. We got rid of those with our advanced medicine. Like, you could have just closed the book on the biggest loophole in the entire fucking episode or like season series so far. Uh, so... At this point, it has to be a joke in the writer's room, like, you know, uh, fuck the audience. We're going to have this big thread just hang forever. And we'll just pull on it every now and then be like, yeah, we, we remember this thing is out there. We know it's driving you crazy. No, we're not going to resolve things. Deal with it. it. It was a brilliant nod to their own mistake. Yes. And as soon as I saw that, I'm like, Peter is going to go shit. Nuts yes. For this reference. And, uh, and sure enough, they, he, he has some, like, fun – Robin Picardo has some fun, snar- smarmy dialogue. Because mm-hmm. the next piece of the puzzles, they they go down to engineering. Well, and, and, and I want to – He starts talking mad shit to Janeway about everything that's going on. It's cool to me to see – you know, again, I play a lot of video games and you've got scripted events. And sometimes you use mods or cheat and, like, kind of force your way through things. The game always sticks on the rails – as he kind of starts cheating the environment, he's walk, you know, uh, Barkley is showing up in areas with him and everybody else can see him. It's not like Barkley's invisible. Uh, you know, uh, the EMH goes down to engineering and, and Janeway's like, you, who are you? And if you are the EMH, how are you even here? And like watching these scenes from the pilot try to adapt around him screwing around with uh, the reality as they know it. Uh, works out really well. He's also just wantonly deleting people. Like the the yeah. green, the doctor's voice is he's like, oh, wait a minute. I programmed Paris and Barkley's like, no, I actually modeled him off my cousin Frank. And like the joy in the doctor's face, he's like, delete Paris, delete Kim. And then uh, when they get into engineering, he's talking all this mad, not really talking shit, but he's like, look, I got my own agenda. This is all bullshit. And I'm sure this seems very serious to you, but I know how this goes. He tries to shut Janeway off. The voice command fails. And she's about to have uh, security step over and arrest him. And he's like, well, actually, you won't because you guys are all about to get, you know, again, like he's read ahead in the story. He's like, yeah, page 36. You guys are all about to get teleported to the what you later come to find out is the caretaker station. Um, Banjo man. (laughs) Banjo man. Uh, And he's just like lays the whole fucking plot of uh the pilot out at her feet and as she's trying to process this she just gets zipped off to caretaker station to go make the biggest mistake i've ever seen a starship captain make but um a lot of fun there and i think the point for them going down to engineering was barkley saying hey look let's prove that you're really a human and have you destroy the main holographic uh relay for the ship and you know by destroying that, you'll know that you're a real person and not just a hologram. Yeah, he's, he's trying to solve the truth of his own existence, which is going to be a bigger point here in a second. And he wants to be sure he's real. And so Barkley convinces him that if he destroys this, then clearly he must be real because he would have destroyed himself if if, uh, if he weren't. And he gets a phaser out and he destroys the hollow matrix. He is not gone and he is subsequently convinced that he is a real person and right after this is i think the most interesting shot in the episode he he suddenly feels a tremendous amount of pain and barkley's been trying to convince him hey you know you're you're quickly dying of like you know brain terribleness so yeah you're you're we need to wrap this up and this seems to be a suggestion that that's true and the way they framed Barkley in the shot is that he's in the background with kind of in the crux uh, in the uh, in the kind of the crux of of Picardo's arm as he like contemplates this pain and it's kind of where uh, Dwight Schultz's performance takes a turn of being less reg like and more sinister 
it's and that shot was framed in the way that he starts talking like yes you are real yes you really do have to destroy yourself uh, you have to destroy the the ships that you can prove that you're real that you're real and you're like oh whoa 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 where's where's do you this remember going? that episode do you remember that episode in next gen when um uh... It's not the time. It's not the Tomalock fake holodeck episode with. Uh, well, it always seemed like Riker ended up in the middle of "Am I going crazy?" episodes. Uh, the the frame of mind one where it starts off with a play and then it ends up with him in a alien psych torture facility. Yes, it's a one where like he shatters into a million pieces in the one scene towards the end. Yes, it's one of these great like I I like to call them space madness episodes. Am I real? Is this real? What's really happening? Are alien influencers trying to get me to sabotage this? all the stuff we were talking about earlier? I got really heavy vibes of uh, that episode at this point. And uh, I think as far as the space madness episodes go, this one really pulls it off. I think the best. I completely agree because it isn't until now that you know that this is space madness. And that it is a real interesting take on the idea. Up to this point, it's like, is this an alien trying to get the doctor to do some shit by hijacking this program and trying to talk him into it? Like, is there a normal kind of surface level sci-fi explanation? It's this shot where you start to understand, no, this is sinister on an entirely different level. This is personal. There is something fucked up about what we're watching. And what we come to understand here is that this is all essentially in the doctor's head, which is real fucking deep because Chakotay comes in and says, don't fucking blow up the warp core doctor. Reginald Barkley is lying to you. This is all a malfunction that's happening exclusively to you. And it is your program that is manifesting everything you're seeing now as a feedback loop, as a consequence we're trying to get you out, but if you blow that up, you're basically going to end up eating yourself, destroying yourself in the feedback loop. So don't do it. And uh, how did it, you it think just Chicote in that delivery? You know, you could have had essentially any character do that. Mm -hmm. he, I think he did a fine job. Um, I think that it should have absolutely have been the captain. Mm. because the captain's the only person we've or Kess but they used Kess better in a different way here in a second but so I understand why it wasn't her but uh I think it should have been the captain because the captain would have had the personal relationship with the doctor enough to maybe like emote but may, come to think of it though now that I'm talking through it and I'm thinking about this point I think it's better that it was Chakotay because he kind of delivers it all robotically and makes you wonder for a second, like, is what he is saying true? I, I've been putting a lot of thought into Chakotay lately. I think he really is the best assistant coach on the ship. And it's what he should be as, you know, the executive officer. But I think Chakotay's position as a Maquis trader, a former leader, you know, a guy who's not afraid to lunge across a table and punch someone in the mouth. I think if there's anybody who should be the emotional Hail Mary guy. Uh, Chakotay's the one. And and that's what this is, is, is the Hail Mary. Like, you need to get a hold of yourself. You need to reject what you're coming to understand to be reality and and stay in there. We believe in you and we're going to make this better. I, I thought he was a great choice for the scene and the lifeline to a potential reality. And I, I think uh, Beltrain did a really good job selling this. I, it's a real from the mouth of madness moment because it starts to come together that all of this self annihilation impulse and questioning about his existence is his own version of his subconscious that is projecting this information out and the kind of nasty pettiness that he's shown and all of these other kind of negative traits are him being made real around him because of this feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And it, it, when that starts to sink in, uh, that's when they really, you know, like triple down on Barkley just being this real sinister kind of 
you know, you have to destroy this. You have to blow this up. It's the only way to prove that you're a real person. I, I didn't kind get, of, I, I didn't get the Barkley sinister angle. I think both, both sides of the reality coin. One is the Chakotay. Chakotay tells him, Hey, this is a holodeck issue. You went in there to go enjoy a day off and something terrible happened because, you know, that's why we have the danger room on the ship is to fucking trap people in hellish <laughs> nightmare situations. Um, and I'm going to harp on that here in a little bit, but you know, you got the Chicote reality and then you've got the, the Barkley reality. I don't see the Barkley stuff really as sinister and evil. He's portraying it with a sense of urgency. He's saying, look, you're on a limited lifespan here. And if you do not destroy the simulation, you're going to die and bad stuff. Like he, he sells it. I think as someone like my friend is about to die and I have to do whatever it takes to get this guy to snap out of it. And then, he calls in the big guns, which is bringing in the uh, Dr. Zimmerman, the Dr. Zimmerman human persona's wife that had been mentioned earlier, but never really named. So let me clarify what I mean by sinister. I'm not saying snidely whiplash, twirling a mustache, going, yes, yes. I mean, before when we started this episode, he was very reg like. He was very kind of bumbling, a little tiny bit buffoonish, very. Uh, genuinely caring now he's more insistent all of that yeah that that mask is gone the original barkley mask is gone and now he's being just more direct and 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 saying listen yeah yeah yeah. and that change is so noticeable and it was specifically when that pain started that that's why i call it sinister because it's a self-annihilation impulse on the basis of the fact that the doctor desperately wants to be a real boy and he wants these things and he feels like if he does you know like he on some level he this is a release like this is what the episode's communicating as from this part of his subconscious and it's it's the the grand slam comes when his wife shows up which is jennifer lean playing kess but Ever so slightly different, saying this is Cass Zimmerman, your wife, and she's just playing the oh my my Lewis my 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 husband please no don't do this to yourself, you know I'm real you're real we're our we you know our love is real, and and really trying to talk him into to essentially destroying himself. So she lays it on heavy, and now you've got Barkley. And Kess on one shoulder, kind of like the devil's, like, destroy the warp core. And then on the other shoulder, you've got Chakotay, which, you know, by the, everything we've established prior to some little bits of praise here and there about uh, Chakotay, what a what a terrible situation. You've got Kess, this woman you love who could be your wife, and then this other guy who's laying down some pretty feasible Star Trek science. Uh, and then the captain of the other team is fucking Chakotay. <laughs> what a shit sandwich yeah i mean you know uh, but uh but you know instead of firing um the doctor holds back and then suddenly woo she opens his eyes he is back in uh sick bay and uh you know his dying words while he condemned himself to the the radiation death was uh Kess, you know, I always wanted to tell you how beautiful you are. And that's what he wakes up saying. So when he opens his eyes and sees everybody standing around and, you know, basically the game is over, Kess catches him and she says, wait, what? And, oh, you know, he's he's kind of caught with this real awkward moment where he's basically admitted uh, an attraction to a co-worker um, and plays it off like, oh, yeah, look, I was under a lot of stress. <laughs> and uh, they kind of wrap the episode up by telling him that, look, you know, uh, that Barkley guy, yeah, he did work, and they kind of give you some information about what ends up happening with uh, Reginald Barkley, that he was a part of the EMH development team, specifically, as Kim says it, in charge of testing interpersonal skills, which seems like a real bad failure on Barkley's behalf. <laughs> Barkley knows good hologram interactions. Barkley knows uh, tender love and care from um, force field hands. That is not the doctor. Bad job, Barkley. Yeah, you, it's either a real dig at Barkley being a, a socially incompetent or a real dig at Barkley not being good at his job. You're absolutely right. But uh, the episode wraps, you know, it's it's got that rap feeling. That's 
Yeah. That's the best part of the scene. It's like the oh, we're we're there. We're at the end. We're at the Tess end. comes up and she's like, "So you know, you think I'm oh, uh, Doctor?" In classic Star Trek fashion, like the most traumatic shit happens to these Starfleet guys. There is no like PTSD. They must have like PTSD happy pills they take and just make everything cool for whatever space horror, <laughs> subspace dark, uh, like, time oh. travel paradox, uh, trip to your own personal hell. It's like, well, that happened. Moving on. I'm going to get back into fucking around with these Petri dishes. And Kess is like, so you think I'm pretty? And it's like, well, you know, I was under a lot of stress and uh, you can't take that as word. And then she's like, so you're saying I'm ugly? And I'm kind of like, geez, Kess, you're being real needy right now. And he's like, well, I didn't say that. And then she just wigs out and says, you hate me after all. I knew our marriage was shaky, but I believe we can save this. And she throws herself on her. It's like, gotcha, bitch. This episode isn't over yet. (laughs) Needle off the fucking record, man. I'm like, whoa. Oh, that's whoa. Jonathan Frakes delivering. What a great move. Like, they really. Yeah, so Captain. Ry- I'm sorry, uh, Commander Riker, Jonathan Frakes, uh, turns out to have been the director for this, which I missed during the intro credits. And right back into that frame of mind rabbit hole of it never ends and the madness keeps going, man. They kick you right back into this thing hard and they pan out to the fish the wide eye fish lens, yeah, fish eye lens which yeah. i criticized earlier in emanations because they used it all the time to like try and like set you off they use in the more traditional tng sense which is for the the exact um you know climax of insanity as he starts stumbling around uh sick bay with basically a flood of all of the shit he's encountered previously in the episode. The Kazon show back up with rifles. Uh, Chakotay's there saying something. Uh, what other crazy stuff There's is going on There's a version of Zimmerman on the table with like an arm burnt talking in Janeway's voice. I mean, it's like David Lynch to the max. It's the absolute height of insanity, as you said. Although I'm still getting over your concept from a minute ago of all of Starfleet officers are high on on like Zoloft to to get over dealing with you know a space Cthulhu shit, but I, I think you might be on to something with that. Uh, and I, I suddenly, jarringly, but somehow more clearly, real, uh, the scene the scene shifts to the holodeck. Like there's some subtle difference. I wish I could pin it down between when they cut to sick bay and they cut to the holodeck. You know that holodeck scene feels safer and it feels more real and it feels like it really is over. It's plausible because the first, the full sending they gave you was him waking back up in sick bay and it was all a dream with the the comedy zinger of like, Kess, you're so beautiful and her catching it. It's when uh, Zimmerman on the table opens his mouth and it starts talking in the captain's voice and then the captain putting a hand, spinning him around. And it's like, you're not really out of the frying. You're out of the fire. You're still in the frying pan. You know, you're on the holodeck. You got the people there. They start debriefing him. Um, It's a little bit more cold. It's not everybody standing around warm and lovely dovey. And I think that's what gives you the plausibility of, hey, we're we're coming back from a real problem here and, and we're here for you and Luckily, we were able to save you. Now they wrap the episode on a conversation between the Doctor and Kess, where where the Doctor has clearly told Kess at least some of what happened, including the part where in in his psychosis they were married, uh, which she quickly says, yeah, okay, that's that's cute, but please don't tell my boyfriend. Don't tell Snarf Snarf. Don't tell my jealous, abusive boyfriend Neelix because he gets so mad – and he just starts pissing all over my clothes. He's such a bad space cat. He shreds all the, the drapes. It's a real problem. And it it ends on a really cool note. Um, you know, Cass tries to postulate why his program's errors manifested itself in that way. And, and the doctor says, well, I don't know either because I know exactly who I am. I'm the MH I, uh, on Voyager. And clearly... He's hiding his own damage about his self awareness. Um, you know, they they end it in a kind of a funny moment to try and soften the blow, and that Kess says, "Are you sure about that?" and then leaves, which is super mean. <laughs> and he eventually kind of like, <laughs> who does that? Have you ever had a conversation with someone who has really just gone through some shit, like? 
oh man, you know, I feel so conflicted. My dad died and he was abusive and I always wanted this day to come. And, you know, now that's here, I should be happy he's dead, but I feel weird. And then I mean, you turn to your friend and be like, was he really that bad? Or, or, you know, did, did you really want this to happen? And then turn away with a smirk and walk away and like leave you stinging there it on was, the floor. It was definitely an absolute dick mood on Kiss's part, but it, it ends the episode what's supposed to be a comedy beat where he kind of slowly gets up, meanders over to the door and like checks to see if his hologram exists outside the door, which was a big tell for him that there was that he was real before. What it is silently saying is that he does have this like this this unclear sense of self, which of course is what the whole episode is about. And so even now he's questioning what he is. Now it's played for a little bit of light light laughter there at the end of the episode, but it goes to they play it like someone who is pinching themselves after a nightmare to make sure they're still right. they're That's actually how they play it, time. but it belays a darker, deeper truth about the doctor and that he is at war with himself in that he feels that uh, maybe he should be a real boy. He wants to be a real boy. He and wants he's more. Not, and he's aware that he's not, and he's aware that he wants to be more than what he just said that he is. And uh, then the episode ends... And I'm like, that was really fucking good. That was deep ass fucking storytelling. That was so unlike everything else on this fucking show. This was excellent the entire way through, minus Neelix keeping a Kazon rifleman at bay with fruit, which we can kind of forgive because it's a hollow novel gone off its rails, essentially, and some built in camp. Um, did you like this more than uh, Eye of the Needle? Yes, I did. Um, absolutely. I could definitely put this now on, on top of my Voyager list. And the beginning is slow, but it you went, once it finally kicks in, you understand why it was. Um, mm-hmm. I vaguely remember this episode mostly because I knew Barkley was in it, but I didn't mm-hmm. remember all of these beats at all. I certainly was not old enough to appreciate it, and I hadn't seen it since I first saw it when I was in junior high or whatever. And when we talked about what this episode, you know, we, we did the read in for what it was going to be. Um, I thought that this was going to be the episode where uh, he basically exceeds his storage capacity. And, you know, they have a, a dilemma. And that's why, you know, that's the hologram centric episode. I had no idea it was going to go this direction. And again, me not seeing the stuff in advance, there were so many viable paths. Is this, you know, is this really back at Starfleet command and, and Dr. Zimmerman got an encoded message from Starfleet and was like living through memories. Is this uh you know, an alien influencer? Is this really him caught in a personal hell? Uh, great writing. And they didn't play their hand early or, or lose anything as far as a uh, storytelling opportunity goes. And top marks the Jonathan Frakes, whose interesting camera work and direction uh really sells the episode as it goes on and the rabbit hole gets deeper and deeper and great use of Barkley and I'm glad it's not the last time we see him on this show like so a couple of things from the um the production notes that were interesting so Brandon Braga who did the 37s which was a fucking travesty also wrote this one and also coincidentally uh did write that frame of mind episode which I got really heavy um shades of earlier and and it makes sense that he was able to tap into that craziness especially with frakes at the helm um this episode proved to the studios that frakes would be a solid choice to direct um first contact and it was because of the camaraderie on the set between robert picardo and barkley and frakes that uh we do get a little taste of emh and uh, Barkley in First Contact. No kidding. Oh, wow. That makes so much sense now. Yeah. That makes so much yeah. sense now. Because, yeah, definitely uh, First Contact was the best next-gen movie. And, and uh, uh, you know, I'm sure you can ascribe a lot of that to, to Frake's uh, style of, of 
dramatic flourish behind the camera to the extent that you really know he's doing it opposed to some of the the house guys that got like Livingston and that sort of thing that kind of just shoot everything flat and boring. And uh, yeah, like the both the animation Barkley do have cameos in that movie. So, oh, mm-hmm. wow. That's stunning, stunning insight, but uh, this was done super well and it deserves the accolades. And dare I say, this was so good. I forgive Braga for the 37s. It's monumental of you to say that. And I am going to be forced to agree that this star of the Christmas tree of Voyager shines so brightly that it was able to force the 37s into an ugly, ugly shadow uh, to, to not be uh so stag or vicious in my mind um two things i took away from this episode uh since we're counting one yet another dangerous holodeck episode where a crew member uh, a crew member of uh the vo- of a starfleet vessel has been tortured to their limits by fantastic technology gone awry Please, Captain Janeway, turn this goddamn thing off. You, <laughs> you sadist. <laughs> you continue to punish your crew. And it's like just jamming a, 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 a butter knife into an infant's hand and plopping him down in front of an electrical outlet. You know what's going to happen. It's not going to be good. Stop the madness. Uh, so one, yet another dangerous holodeck episode. And two, I'm going to argue... Uh, that this is another Lost Soul episode. That for a good chunk of this episode, the Doctor is a real boy. He bleeds, he has feelings, he has emotions. Uh, He feels pain, he feels love of his wife. And uh, at the end, when the holodeck lines fade, uh, so does the soul that he was gifted, and he is left being yet another autonomous, lifeless husk to shamble forward in the uh, series with no inner spark i'm gonna go and out on a limb and say um that i disagree with your point about the doctor only because i know what is to come with him and this is a preview of some great shit that we're gonna get to see over the course of the years with the doctor he might get his soul back, but I'm saying he was given a soul in this episode and through technology botch by the end, it is taken away from him. He can redeem himself, but as of right now, he's joining my no soul club. Okay. Along with Harry Kim, who coincidentally lost his soul in another holodeck mishap. So <laughs> he's in good company. Okay. You know what? I, I, uh, I will, I will subscribe to your newsletter and, and buy that for a dollar. And on that note, I think we can, uh, we can uh, – do you have a, a reading from the Frankie Bible for this one? I do, as a matter of fact. This is a real good one. Uh, this is uh, Frankie Rule of Acquisition number 190. Hear all and trust nothing. <laughs> that is a good one, my man. Very nice. Mm-hmm. What I saw that when I was very happy with that. From here, uh, our score right now – I mean, this is season two. I would say two out of th- – I personally may say two out of three of the episodes we've seen so far have been good, if not excellent. We're going to move into season two, episode four, Elogium. Uh, Voyager encounters new life forms that have very unusual attractions to the ship. Yeah, I don't remember this one at all. Uh, I like the game we started playing, which is who is the worst person on the ship to feature okay. predominantly in this episode in the wrong role. So Voyager continue, encounters new life forms that have very unusual attraction to the ship. Uh, who Who's your bet for the worst person to put up front on this one? I will point out that the person you picked last week for this was Chicote, and you just admitted he was the best. So your track record, it's a big zero, zero and one. Uh, I picked... Props uh, to me for pointing out that he was a crutch role in this, though. I That was a good prediction. I, I, uh, I point out Neelix would be the worst, and he was the worst part of this episode, so... Uh, so one, that's a bang for me. Let's uh, put that on the board. Uh, All right. New life form, attracted to the ship, worst person, Harry Kim. I'm going to go with Harry Kim on this one. Harry Kim is going to have to be mine too. Anytime there's anything involving romance, although encounters <laughs> new life forms that have a very unusual attraction to the ship, 
In my mind, I'm going to tell you what the the crazy, gross part of the internet brain suggests that this is. These terrible drawings that I see mucking around the internet. Have you seen the ones with like the this fetish where people draw dragons having sex with cars, like their penises up the tailpipes of cars? Jesus, no. God. <laughs> it's terrible. I know you mentioned That's the chain at the beginning, beginning of this, but are you now brow are you are you in the in the chans? Do we I, need, dude, do we I come need across intervention? My hateful treks do not limit to just Voyager. I'm out there seeing all sorts of stuff. I wish I had it. Shut the fuck up. There's no way you're going to 4chan. I'm afraid of my own personal exposure on Reddit. There's a difference here. Uh, in my mind, this this is going to be an episode about like some big space whale. Like uh, that was a next gen episode, wasn't it? Though, like the mommy and they had to like, use a phaser to cut the thing open, and then the little space baby came out and was like latched onto the hull. There's a lot of ship on ship mating. This this is a filthy <laughs> universe. I gotta go. This, yeah, well, we gotta let's, stop. Let's here. Cut it off I, I there. Go. Uh, thank you for very much for listening to Feature Please a Hateful Voyage through the Delta Quadrant. Please share, like, subscribe, do things, let people know we're out there. We want to entertain them. We entertain you, and the more the merrier. If you take public transportation, uh, like buses or subways or whatever, feel free to like cue this up on your phone speaker and play it very loudly. No one will mind. Um, Everyone will applaud. Yeah, our profanity, perfectly accept. Talk about dragons humping cars and tailpipes. That's perfect for for public consumption. Absolutely. You have my permission. Yes. And uh, my name is Joseph. I'm Peter. And uh, this has been Vijer Please with our seal of approval signing off.